Good evening, everyone. I'm calling Arlington's annual town meeting session 10 to order on Wednesday, May 25th. We can uh, close the, uh, uh, the check-in vote. And after that's closed, we'll uh, let's just cycle through those screens so everyone can see. Um, I'm not seeing the display up for, there we go. They want to verify whether their test vote got in. And then after that we're done with that, we'll, um, uh, we'll go to the Star Spangled Banner performance. All right, thank you. Before we get started uh, uh, with the business of the meeting, I just have some quick uh, remarks. First, I want to acknowledge the tragedy yesterday in Uvalde, Texas. I don't have any words that are adequate for this moment. Uh, at the same time, today is the two-year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. I also want to remind everyone that we will not be meeting next Monday, May 30th, in observance of Memorial Day. Let's take a brief moment of silence for the victims of these tragedies, as well as those who sacrificed their lives for our benefit and those affected by their loss. Thank you. If you're feeling a lot of emotions about these events, like I am, know that you're not alone. There are many ways to honor the victims of these tragedies one way is to continue to use our voices, use the privilege that we've inherited from the sacrifices of others, as we'll observe Monday on Memorial Day to affect change in our communities through the democratic process. As we head into debate on zoning articles tonight, which can be a contentious topic, let us summon the better angels of our nature, harness our emotions and put them to work constructively with civility for the benefit of our town. And a quick note about the voting portal you'll notice that there will now be yellow highlighted text when we open voting. The text isn't new, but the highlighting is so, so that it's more clear when your wave of precincts is waiting for voting uh, to be enabled. Uh, next on the agenda is the swearing in of new town meeting members, and we're not gonna do that in the meeting, uh, but if you're a new town meeting member and you have still not been sworn in with the oath of office, uh, please contact uh, the town clerk, uh, Ms. Brazil. Um, and with that, I recognize the chair of the select board, Mr. Diggins. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. 
It is moved that if all business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, then when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, June 1st, 2022 at 8 p.m. Okay, do we have a second to Mr. Diggins' motion? Second. We have a second from Mr. Foscott. Uh, any objections, please raise hands. Um, uh, if, if you have objections to uh, Mr. Diggins' motion to uh, reconvene at uh, on Wednesday, June 1st at 8 p.m. next week. Right. Seeing no hands raised, no objections in Zoom, uh, motion passes. Um, I now call for any announcements or resolutions uh, through raised hands in Zoom, Zoom please. Okay, we have a, a raised hand from Ms. Wiener. Let's bring her up. Laura Wiener, Precinct 8. I wanted to let people know that the Jason Russell House is reopening for tours this Saturday, May 28th through October 20th. The house is open for guided tours Saturdays and Sundays from one to four. Masks are required for admission. The Jason Russell House is the site of fighting on April 19th, 1775, now observed as Patriots Day, and is run by the Arlington Historical Commission. It's a great place to bring family and friends, especially out of town guests. For more information, you can visit the arlingtonhistorical.org. Great, thank you, Ms. Wiener. Do we have any other uh, announcements or resolutions before we move on? Okay. Seeing none, um, I, I now call for reports that are ready to be received. Mr. Mr. Foskett, Moderator? Foskett. Yes. Um, Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. I move that Article 3 be removed from the table. Okay, do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Ms. Brazil to Mr. Foskett's motion to uh, remove Article 3 from the table. Um, um, and any objections in, in Zoom, in raised hands? Seeing none, Article 3 is now before us. We're ready to see, receive reports. Um, so please use raised hands in Zoom if you have any reports uh, that are ready to be received by town meeting. Okay, seeing no hands. Uh, Mr. Foskett? Mr. Moderator, Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. Okay, do we have a second to Mr. Foskett's motion? Second. We have a second from Ms. Brazil uh, to, to Mr. Foskett's motion to lay Article 3 on the table. Uh, any objections in Zoom? Seeing none, Article 3 is now back on the table. And that brings us to uh, back to uh, Article 28. Um, so let's bring that up. And this is where we left off from Monday night. Um, okay, so we should have the speaking queue back up. Okay, so uh, let's take uh, Mr. Kepline to, to start us off tonight. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. Uh, I, I'd like to get an idea of what sort of uh, construction is compliant with the uh, new zoning um, design. Um, for example, the building that's between the high school and stop and shop, the mixed use one. Would that be compliant? That's it. So we don't have uh, Ms. Zemberry with us tonight. She's traveling tonight. Uh, we do have, uh, I was not uh, I was told that uh, Mr. Revlak could answer questions uh, from the ARB. Mr. Revlak, um, can we bring him up? See if he's able to answer that. Uh, hello, Mr. Moderator, Steve Revelock, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Um, I had not uh, considered that particular um, building, but if you'd like, I can walk through the requirements or if Mr. Kaplan would like. Oh, no, I, I wanted, you know, some tangible examples, you know, <laughs> rather than sort of abstract specifications. So in that particular building, mm -hmm. the first, it's... Uh, it's zero setback and it's got windows on the first floor to engage the street and sidewalk, yet the windows are all whited out because there's a preschool there. Mm-hmm. Well, so, uh, Ms. Ms. Raid is with us tonight from the planning department, she might, uh, in case she's able to answer. Uh, Ms. Raid, do you have an answer to Mr. Kepline's question? Well, 
let me finish. Okay. So, um, you know, so if a, if a tenant is going to white out the you know the windows and make them opaque to the street, doesn't that defeat the purpose of uh, sidewalk engagement? And is that is that uh, allowed? And are there any restrictions on what a tenant can do? Thank uh, you. So in the case of, I mean, this is not the only element of the bylaw in play. In the case of the preschool, uh, the use is protected by the Dover Amendment. Um, and what we are, you know, as a redevelopment board would be doing would be to, um, you know, ensure, you know, standards around that. We, we you know, you can't reject them based on that use, uh, to, to my knowledge. Um, you know, the... There is a ground floor transparency, and they have provided fenestration. But of course, it is a preschool, so they are um, they are you know frosting the windows to provide some privacy for the children. Without speaking for the redevelopment board as a whole, I that strikes me as perfectly reasonable to do. Uh, okay, sure, but I mean. I, I'm wondering, you know, what good is this zoning change do if people can then go ahead and do anything like that? Mr. Revelin? Well, so it's not simply, you know, there's because preschools are not the only form of business which open in Arlington. Um, I think you have to consider how the proposed change would apply ac across a variety of cases. So if it were a restaurant, um, you know, then the windows would you know, presumably be not frosted so you know you could see inside uh, generally you know as, as far as the the board goes in my experience we have light ground floor transparency but we are but we are cognizant of cases where um you know transparency may not be the best option for example a massage parlor or yoga studio or uh a food bank but, but those are, are uh, other examples, too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's take Mr. Rosenthal next. Name and precinct, please. Uh, Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. Um, <clears throat> first, let me apologize for not having taken notes at the end of Monday night because I had a clearly formulated question Monday night and the recollection of what that question was is only slowly coming back to me. Well, the, the best, the, the best uh, approximation you have. Yes. Um, it's, if I remember correctly, one of the things that was mentioned with regard to this article had to do with creating more vibrancy. And part of that had to do with, uh, with restaurants. Now, it's my understanding that a number of the buildings being torn down and then reconstructed are being built with uh, without facilities. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what all, but you know, exhaust fans and ba basically designed in such a way that they're really not designed to be able to hold restaurants. Um, to uh, by hold, I mean contain restaurants, and so I'm wondering. Um, how, you know, what will this article have any effect on changing that so that uh, when the ARB considers uh, permitting uh, new buildings, that there's some requirement that uh, they're built in such a way that, uh, you know, that they can uh, contain restaurants and that a restaurateur would actually want to open a restaurant there? Uh, Mr. Replock? Steve Revelock, Arlington Redevelopment Board. That's an orthogonal question. Uh, so tip, in my experience, when the re the board has had uh, applic there are, there are cases where the board has asked, um, you know, proponents to install uh, venting and such so that a, you know, the first floor would be, um, you know, 
could could be easily used as a restaurant. This article doesn't address that directly. It's this article again is is more about facade treatment, about fenestration, um, about lobby placement and detailing and and so on. So then, would it be correct to say that the uh, comments about this making Arlington more vibrant because uh, it will it will improve or increase the number of restaurants um, really is not that 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 argument really is not particularly relevant to uh, you know to, to well so what this article would yeah. Yeah. oh sorry mr chair what this article would prevent i i think it's um what the, all right so what this article would pr prevent is a restaurant who's for example a restaurant whose front wall was a blank facade okay but it's it's not going to uh it sounds like it's not going to accomplish a lot in terms of inviting new restaurants in is that, uh, that is correct. The, the article is not written to was not written to favor any particular form of business. Thank you. Okay, Let, let's take Mr. Tosti next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Alan Tosti, Precinct 17. Uh, I move the question on all issues involved in this article. Okay, so we have a motion from Mr. Tosti to terminate debate. Um, uh, do we have a second? We have a second from Mr. Moore. Uh, so let's um, let's take a vote on whether to terminate debate. So has the opening of voting been confirmed? There we go. Okay, voting uh, should start opening for at least some waves of voting. Okay, so we're voting here. So if you see the, the yellow highlighted text uh, telling you which wave, it means that uh, you're you're your wave of precinct uh, has not been made, uh, uh, has not been open to voting yet. Um, if you're able to vote, um, please vote. And we're voting here on whether to terminate debate on Article 28 um, Zoning Bylaw Amendment uh, about enhanced business districts. If you want to terminate debate, um, vote yes. If you want to continue debate, you can vote no. And this is a two thirds vote. Okay, we have almost 200 votes cast at this point. Uh, still missing over 50. Okay, the votes are coming in pretty quickly, that's good. Um, let's give another 30 seconds until we close voting. Twenty seconds. Again, this is for termination of debate on Article 28. Ten seconds. Five seconds until we close voting. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 190 in affirmative, 24 in negative. Um, debate is terminated. Let's now open up voting on the main motion. Again, we're, we're, we're no longer gonna wait for the, the voting screens uh, to be shown for termination of debate votes, just so we can speed things along but we will do so on main motions and other uh, and substitutes and amendments. Uh, okay, so voting should now be opening at least for one of the waves of precincts. So if you are in favor of the main motion, 
of Article 28, uh, zoning bylaw change um, about enhancing business districts. Uh, vote yes. If you're opposed, vote no. It says add section 5.5.2 to the zoning bylaw um, titled uh, Development Standards for Business Districts. And this main motion is it does require a two thirds vote. Okay, we have 200 votes cast at this point. Okay, let's just wait another, um, it's almost everybody. Uh, let's just wait another 20 seconds before we close voting. You can always vote in the Q&A if you have trouble through the portal. 10 seconds until we close voting. Five seconds. Okay, let's close voting on Article 28, main motion. And vote passes, 203 in the affirmative, 11 in the negative. Um, and we, we will wait for these screens. Um, And then after we've gone through all the, the voting screens for all the precincts, we'll, uh, we'll bring up Article 29, which is now before us. Okay, let's, uh, let's bring up Article 29. And let's see, uh, Mr. Um, let's see. Oh, we can actually, um, uh, let's, uh, let's bring up uh, Ms. Rate. Do you want to introduce uh, this article, or we could have Mr. Revelac uh, introduce it if you'd rather from the redevelopment board? Uh, Ms. Rate? I'm, pre I'm prepared to do so. Oh, good evening, and thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jennifer Rate, Director of Planning and Community Development. I am introducing Article 29 on behalf of the ARB as their secretary ex officio. I would like to request that the pre-recorded video presentation be shown to introduce this article. Mr. Okay. Uh, I think some of Ms. Wright's audio is cut off, but uh, let's, let's bring up the video. Hello, I'm Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, also known as the ARB, and I will be taking you through Warren Article 29, a bylaw amendment related to street trees for the 2022 annual town meeting. There is currently an existing town bylaw, Article 16, related to tree protection and preservation. It describes town procedures and requirements for preservation of trees. It applies only to trees located on private property. The tree warden maintains a tree inventory and plants 200 to 300 new street trees annually. In enacting this additional requirement, this would be following local and regional precedent, including following the requirements described in the site standards section of the Industrial Zoning District Amendments adopted by 2021 Arlington Town Meeting, and aligning with the zoning bylaws throughout the Commonwealth, 
that require public shade trees as required as part of development or redevelopment of commercial areas. The proposed amendment follows standards set forth in other communities regarding tree placement, size, type, and maintenance. The purpose of the amendment is to provide for adequate public shade tree coverage along Arlington's main corridors, implement carbon neutral policies of the town of Arlington, address heat island effects emanating from Arlington's main corridors, enhance public health and walkability with proper shading, and create a zoning bylaw definition for public shade trees consistent with state law. The text of the new sections requires the implementation of new shade trees along our business corridors for new construction, major addition and redevelopment projects subject to the jurisdiction of the ARB with certain exceptions. The new section includes standards for the implementation of shade trees in the business corridors, including location, species, size, and maintenance, as well as the provisions for the ARB to modify or exempt pro projects from compliance when incompatible with existing conditions of the public way. The new section also includes provisions for the number and spacing of shade trees required. The amendment establishes minimum standards for newly planted public shade trees, including selection from the approved list by the tree warden, standards for height and caliber, location of tree plantings, appropriate distance between public shade trees, and maintenance standards. It also describes exemptions for certain applicants under special circumstances. The ARB believes that this bylaw amendment aligns, aligns with the town's practice of the preservation and protection of trees. The ARB voted five to zero at our April 4th meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 29. Thank you. Okay, thank you. With that, let's uh, let's go to the speaking queue and uh, let's take uh, Ms. Bloom. Uh, name and precinct. And, yeah. uh, Nancy Bloom, precinct 18. I just have a question. Uh, I was just curious how we will be making sure that all the street trees uh, the additional ones would be monitored and, and watered appropriately. I know it says that the, the tree warden would help with that, but I just wanted to know particularly how that would be done. Uh, let's well first go to Mr. Revelak, and if he's not able to answer, we can go to someone else. Mr. Revelak, do you have an answer for that from the uh, redevelopment board? Uh, Steve Revelak, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, there is a there is a requirement that the trees be maintained for a period of no less than 36 months. Uh, this is a requirement in the zoning bylaw, and the zoning enforcement officer in the town of Arlington is the building inspector. So for specific details on enforcement, uh, Mr. Moderator, I would have to defer to one of the building inspectors. Okay. Um, do we have uh, Ms. Bloom? Does, does that answer satisfy you, or would you like to go? I, I'd just be curious what their pl what the plans are. Sure. So, uh, do we have uh, Mr. Champa? Is is he available? And I don't know if he's under his jurisdiction. Or do we have the perhaps the warden with us? Um, who could answer? Let's see. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Mr. Heim, why don't you go ahead? You have your hand raised. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Doug Heim, Town Council. So uh, the good news is there might be some folks from the tree committee uh, here as well. And um, while the zoning enforcement officer has the ability to uh, the exclusive jurisdiction to enforce the zoning bylaw, I would imagine that it will be a team effort. I would imagine that Mr. Laqueve, the tree warden, would be minding these trees and keeping an eye out for um, for trees that are not being properly cared for, and that he might have to report that information and record it so that a zoning enforcement officer can um, record a violation. There's also a wonderful set of folks, uh, both who are on the tree committee and a team of folks who volunteer a lot of time and interest to make sure our regular street trees are uh, well maintained. So um, I would imagine that it'll be a combination of those folks and they might have to build a record for the uh, zoning enforcement officer. But there are a lot of folks uh, out there uh, keeping an eye on uh, trees for violations of different kinds involving shade trees. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Heim. Uh, Ms. Bloom, does that, does that satisfy your question? Or Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Behind. Great, thank you. Let's take uh, Ms. Babiaris next.
Joe Babiars, Precinct 15. I have a very quick question. If this is on private property, has what would be the impact on electrical lines and other utilities that might be having to go to these particular buildings? Um, is that taken into account? And is that gonna be the responsibility of the tree warden to discuss or determine, or is that gonna fall back on the private businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's go to Mr. Revlock first, um, and then we could try other folks if, um, if he doesn't have it. Mr. Revlock? Yeah, I, I think the intent of the proposed bylaw, Mr. Moderator, Steve Revelock, Arlington Redevelopment Board, is uh, that these trees be planted in the public right-of-way, um, so not necessarily on private property. Uh, to the extent that you know excavation is needed for the tree, I believe dig safe rules would apply. Um, and, you know, you would just have to uh, so call before you dig, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Babiars, uh, uh, did you want to go further with that? Or? Does it also impact the, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Joe Babiars, Precinct 15. Does it also impact, if they're on the public right of way, is it going to impact any of the power lines? On our streets, for example, um, in many residential areas here where, this, where the trees are on the public lines, the um, public right of way, rather, it, the trees are hacked in the center and they just have stuff going on either side of the power lines. Is that what is going to happen here? Or uh, let's, yeah, let's say, some you, other plan? Sure. Uh, let's. Uh, is Mr. Rademacher here from uh, the Director of uh, Public Works? This seems like it might be a DPW question. I don't see Mr. Rademacher here. How about uh, Mr. Chapdelaine? Do you have an answer? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager. So my, my understanding in working with Mr. Rademacher and Mr. Lequeve, who is the town's tree warden, is that the species they recommend for uh, street trees that would be under power lines are species that would best coexist with those power lines to try to reduce the amount of hacking, so to speak, as was just mentioned, as we see with some of the older Norway maples and other larger trees that are currently planted in the planting street, other, other under power lines. I don't think there is a perfect solution based on the proximity of those lines and the height of really any tree that can provide public shade, but I do know they've made an effort to identify species that can coexist as best possible. Okay. Thank you very much. That's a very reassuring answer. Goodbye. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's take uh, Ms. Culverhouse next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Lynette Culverhouse, Precinct 11. Um, I'm very supportive of this article, but I just have a question. Is there any uh, provision in this amendment to provide for the protection of existing mature trees? Uh, Mr. Revelak, is there anything that protects mature trees in this uh, bylaw change? Steve Revelock, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Um, I believe existing, skimming through, I believe existing trees would, um, would, you know, you would sort of preclude the need to plant a new one. Yeah, in terms of, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, so what this, 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 the proposed bylaw is a standard for new tree planting. Um, so it does not change any of the existing tree protection laws that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh So just to follow up this, um, this there would there would be no protection. If there was an existing mature tree, there would be no additional protection within this amendment for that. I say, uh, Mr. Heim has his hand raised. Let's see if he has an answer to that. Mr. Heim. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Doug Heim, Town Council. Uh, the answer is no, there's not additional protection because public shade trees are covered under chapter 87. There has to be a public hearing in order to remove a public shade tree that folks object to removing. So there's already a process with the tree committee and the select board for any mature tree. Uh, in other words, if, if, if one concern is that people might try to cut down mature trees to plant smaller trees as part of this, 
You can't do that without a public shade tree hearing. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Culverhouse? Okay, thank you. This answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's take uh, Ms. Malofchik next. Is Ms. Malopchik there? Uh, see, um, Ms. Malopchik, can you hear us? I see that it looks like your microphone is not muted, at least in Zoom. Let's see, if you can hear me, Ms. Malopchik, perhaps you could, if you, if you have a uh, question or something you could put in the Q&A, um, if we can get to it that way. Okay. Um, if someone from uh, technical support or IT could try to figure out uh, uh, what's happening with Ms. Malopchik's connection, uh, we'll hopefully be able to circle back. Uh, so. Why don't we take uh, Mr. O'Day next from the speaker queue? Oh, she's asking, can she phone in? Um, and she apparently is, seems to be having trouble with her microphone being recognized by Zoom. Um, let's take a point of, while we're trying to figure that out, let's take a bit point of order from Mr. Rosenthal. Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. I'm just wondering, since this problem has recurred more than once, um, isn't there any way to have somebody uh, dial in through the phone system? Uh, th that's what she is. Uh, Ms. Malofchik was asking that in the Q&A. Uh, Thank uh, you. Can she, can she phone in? Um, can someone uh, on the panel, like from the tech side, uh, just give me a quick answer on whether we can receive a phone call right now? Uh, not seeing any response about that. Um, is is someone is someone actually contacting? Does someone have a way of contacting Ms. Malopchik? Yeah, we're trying to calling him in right now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let's uh, let's take uh, uh, Mr. O'Day. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Brendan O'Day, Precinct 14, I rise to move the question and all matters before it. Okay, uh, before I recognize a second on that, um, I do want to give Ms. Malofchik an opportunity to speak since she's clearly intending to speak. Um, Okay, I see a phone number. I don't know if the intention is for, is someone from the panel calling that or? I believe uh, Viet is on the phone with it. Okay. Is the intention like for technical support or to actually put her through to the meeting? Yes, for technical support. Oh, okay. Let's just hold up a minute here because obviously we have a motion to terminate debate. And so that would be unfortunate uh, if we weren't able to get the speaker to speak. Um, and uh, that's, uh, we have a point of order from Mr. Wagner. Let's take that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. 
Thank you for the wise decision not to allow the motion to terminate debate after Ms. Milovchik's second problem, uh, uh, because it was like this last time when uh, she actually wanted to speak and debate was terminated. Given that there is some time while the technical assistance is provided, I'm sure that some of your speakers would like to speak. I see, for example, I believe the chair of the tree department in the queue of people waiting to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um... That's a fair point. Let, let's um, while we're resolving that issue, let's take and uh, we can return to that uh, to that motion. Um, let's take. Um, so we took Mr. O'Day. Let's take uh, Ms. Stamps. Hi, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, thanks a lot, Susan Stamps, Precinct Three. I'm on the Tree Committee. I'm not speaking for the Tree Committee because. We actually um, were not given the opportunity to discuss this at our meeting, but um, a few of us members did uh, review this article carefully and we did reach out to members of the redevelopment board and were satisfied with their answers. Um, so personally, I feel fine about it, but just to give people a little bit of information that was asked about as far as who's responsible for watering the, <clears throat> the amendment says that the uh, the applicant uh, will comply with some national nursery standards for maintenance for three years. And um, it was told to me by um, one of the redevelopment board members that, that they understand that that includes watering. So that's awesome. So the applicant is responsible for watering and the applicant, even if they, they build the property, I guess if it's out of their hands after a year or so, they're still responsible to maintain those trees or make sure they're maintained for three years. So we're very happy about that. Um, another question was um, whether existing street trees would be um, protected, which is a really important question. And um, the under chapter 87, as, as uh, Mr. Heim explained, you, you can't remove a tree without permission of the tree warden and it has to be unhealthy. Um, but also you can't damage a street tree so that um, there, I'm sure that the tree warden will be monitoring that project and will be and will work with the applicant to put the uh, protective the boards up against the street trees and so on. Um, basically, we're really happy about the idea of sort of this public private partnership that the that here is um, a project where they're going to be adding to Arlington's tree canopy. Um, so I think it actually sets a really good example. And also, by the way, um, these trees don't necessarily have to be exactly in the public way. Um, and we're starting to move towards encouraging people to plant trees on private property that are within the sort of the, the area of the public way. And so this is nice in that direction too. So all in all, um, I recommend that people vote for it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a suggestion in the Q&A, which I was wondering myself, um, uh, whether Ms. Milofchik could just call someone who could actually just put it on uh, uh, either on speakerphone or kind of to transmit the question. Um, okay. Yes, someone in the panel is asking if uh, they can put her on speakerphone. Yes, uh, I I approve of that. Apologies for the delay here. Go ahead, Beth. Beth Milovchik, Precinct 9. <sighs> Sorry, I have to compose myself. That was a technological nightmare. Yes, apologies for that. Putting me on speakerphone. So there are a lot of unknowns based on what I've heard from uh, ARB, which confuses me. I wasn't able to listen to Ms. Stamp's testimony as I was trying to answer phone calls from IT and get and dial in two dozen numbers to get into the Zoom. 
My concerns are that the ARB seems to be carving out tree responsibility for trees. And I'm, I think we have a great tree warden and the tree committee has protocols that are working, but are these like super ARB street trees or as I think I heard Susan Stamps mention, who's responsible for watering them after they're planted? I just, um, it's very confusing to me that there seems to be or have been a lack of coordination with the tree committee and the tree warden. Can the, can someone please speak to that? Uh, let me, let's, uh, we can direct that to Ms. Stamps, uh, if that's all right. Uh, Ms. Stamps, uh, I believe you are a member of the, the tree committee, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Moderator. Um, um, the what I did um, say a few minutes ago when Ms. Milofjik was trying to get in and so she didn't hear what I said was that we actually were concerned about the watering issue. We did follow up with um, members of the ARB and were assured that um, where it says in the amendment that the applicant will be responsible for 36 months of maintenance that that uh, includes watering. So um, I think that's been taken care of. And uh, we see this more as a, as a plus for the town to um, have start putting these kinds of requirements um, of helping the town out um, during projects. So thank you. I have another question. Have another question. Who has final word? Who adjudicates the tree? Is, does the ARB adjudicate whether this tree can be cut down at some future point? Or uh, does the tree warden and the tree bylaw have supreme authority on this? Uh, let's, we can direct that to Ms. Ms. Stamps again. Do you know the answer to that? Um, as I understand it, they're going to be public trees. Perhaps Mr. Rebelak could uh, clarify that, but if they are public trees, then in the future, no, no one can cut them down without permission of the tree warden. Uh, see, Mr. Chaplain has his hand raised. Uh, Mr. Chaplain, do you have an answer? Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Chaplain, Town Manager. Once any tree is planted and becomes a public shade tree, it is then covered by the public shade tree law, which is state law. So as Ms. Stamps just mentioned, it would be governed by those rules and regulations with oversight by the tree warden, holding a hearing, and then ultimate oversight potentially being brought to the select board if an appeal was filed for the tree warden's ruling. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lopchuk. Thank you. Can it be briefly clarified as to what this is doing that hasn't been done before? Like the the articles, like the, the article as a whole, or specific, a specific aspect of it. Well, it seems like the ARB is encouraging the planting of trees. Is that is that what this article is? trees every um, 25 feet in commercial districts. Uh, let's direct that to, to Mr. Revelak. Is, is that the case that um, that the ARB has taken position on the planting of trees? Yeah, uh, yes, Mr. Moderator, Steve Revelak, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, this is a set of standards for tree planting. So yes, we are encouraging the planting of, of public shade trees. In commercial districts. Uh, yes. Yes, it would include commercial right. districts. So it's encouraging, so the ARB is encouraging the planting of trees in commercial and other districts. Doesn't that already exist? Mr. Revlock, uh, they exist in the zoning bylaw? So it exists for our industrial districts. Uh, Mr. Moderator, we modified uh, that section of the bylaw last year and, and introduced a tree planting requirement. Um, for the business districts or, you know, technically it's, or, you know, any, any, well, for areas subject to environmental design review, which can, which include the business districts, but can include other areas. Um, you know, there was not a similar requirement and we are proposing to add one this year. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Malafchuk? Thank you. It's very, still remains confusing. More trees are good. I get the, guess they can duke out the unknowns. 
Thank you very much. And I appreciate the patience of the town moderator and town meeting and facilitating my getting through. Thank you, Ms. Malofchik. And I appreciate your patience. Precinct nine. I appreciate Ms. Ms. Lofton, your patience and the patience of everyone in the meeting uh, as we deal with these technical difficulties. Thank you. Um, so I will now go back to, we had a, a motion to terminate debate by Mr. O'Day. I will now recognize a second from Mr. Hamlin. Um, so let's open up voting for uh, termination of debate. First, we have a point of order from Mr. Jameson. Let's take that. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, I just wanted to note that we had a large discussion um, when we had a pending motion to terminate, which is not debatable. And second of all, I would like to mention that the town meeting, for those who are new to the meeting, has been an extremely strong supporter, as Ms. Stamps um, would attest to, uh, uh, this is getting back into the debate, not the uh, exactly, Mr. Moderator. And the moder and the debate went on with when we had a pending debate to terminate, okay. which we did not okay. do. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator Gordon okay. Jameson. Okay, so let's go back. So um, this also came up in the Q and A. So because it came up in the Q and A, Q and A as well, there was uh, I'll, I'll just briefly mention it. So let's bring up the 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 uh, the, mo the, um, the vote to terminate debate. And as we're bringing that up, I'll briefly explain. Um, uh, someone posted in the Q&A that um, motion to terminate debate is not debatable. Uh, we did not debate it. I simply chose to not recognize a second. Uh, so um, there was nothing to act on at that point as determined by my discretion under the circumstances. So that was not a debate. That was me exercising my discretion as moderator to not recognize a second at that time. Um, and so we now have vote open to Terminate debate on Article 29, zoning bylaw amendment um, uh, about street trees uh, to introduce. Uh, we don't need to get into the details, just uh, if you want to continue debate on Article 29, vote yes. I'm sorry, if, if you want to terminate debate on Article 29, vote yes. If you want to continue debate on Article 29, vote no. This is a two thirds vote to terminate debate. I appreciate everyone's forbearance as we deal with these technical difficulties. Um, when I cut off debate, uh, when similar circumstances have ha happened in the past, there was um, a significant amount of pushback uh, about that. And so uh, I decided to um, uh, ensure that we can actually get someone who is in the queue at the right time and who is selected to be able to speak. Okay, so we have almost 200 votes cast so far. Okay, let's just give another uh, Another 30 seconds before we close voting on termination of debate of Article 29. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds until we close voting on termination of debate. Five seconds. Okay, let's close voting. Okay, and the motion passes. Debate is terminated. 206 in the affirmative to 13 in the negative. We will not wait for the voting screens. We'll go straight to voting on the main motion. And as we bring that up and folks wait to vote, um, this is, okay, I see this screen is back. Hopefully that's, uh, just temporary. Okay, so we're voting now on the main motion of Article 29. Uh, this is a two-thirds vote for zoning, zoning bylaw change to introduce measures that 
intend to enhance the street canopy in our business districts? If you're in favor, vote yes. If you're opposed to this main motion, vote no. If you're seeing the yellow highlighted text in the voting portal about what wave you're in and your voting controls will be enabled in a future wave, just sit tight and it'll open up shortly. And if you don't see the yellow highlighted text, then you should and you see a button to cast your vote, please go ahead and vote. This is a vote on the main motion of Article 29. Um, a zoning bylaw change to introduce measures that intend to enhance the street canopy in our business districts. And we have over 200 votes cast now. Two seventeen. Let's just wait another thirty seconds. You can always get your vote into the Q and type it into the Q and A if uh, you're having trouble through the portal. 20 seconds, main motion, Article 29, two thirds vote. Ten seconds until we close voting. Five seconds. Okay, let's close voting. Okay, the motion passes. 220 in the affirmative, six in the negative. We'll just wait for the uh, all the voting screens to get through all the precincts. If you miss your precinct, you can always view votes in the portal by clicking the view votes button on the left side of your portal window. Okay, so let's, we now have Article 30 before us. So let's bring that up. And while we're waiting for that to come up, um, uh, let's bring up um, uh, Ms. Rate from the Planning Department um, to uh, introduce this, um, this article. Ms. Rate. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Is my audio okay? Yes, it's better now, yeah. Okay, Jennifer Rate, Director of Planning and Community Development. I am introducing Article 30 on behalf of the ARB. As secretary ex officio, I would like to request that the pre recorded video presentation be shown to introduce this article. Would that be possible? Yes, it is. Let's bring it up right now. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rachel Zemberry, chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, also known as the ARB, and I will be taking you through Warren Article 30, a bylaw amendment related to solar energy systems for the 2022 annual town meeting. Ground mounted solar installations are allowed by right in the industrial district only. Solar energy systems in other districts require a building permit but are not prohibited. In historic districts, additional guidelines apply. Since 2010, the town has continued to modify its requirements related to solar energy systems and in 2021 received unanimous endorsement of the net zero action plan by the select board. This amendment follows the guidance of the 2021 Net Zero Action Plan, which placed this amendment as a priority measure. It identified that solar energy systems are a key to achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and calls for every building in Arlington to be net zero energy capable by 2050. To achieve that goal, effectively, all suitable rooftops in Arlington would need a solar energy system 75% of the total, or 9,000 roofs. Looking at local precedents, there are towns with solar bylaw requirements, which include Watertown for new and large commercial, 
Medford for new and large residential and non-residential. And there are towns with design review for solar systems, which include Somerville, Cambridge, and Boston. There are also towns with municipal green building policies, which include Lexington and Wellesley. This proposed amendment begins by defining a photovoltaic system, roof mounted solar voltaic, so excuse me, roof mounted solar photovoltaic systems, solar energy systems, solar ready building, solar ready zones, and solar thermal systems. A project requiring environmental design review shall include a solar energy system that is equivalent to at least 50% of the roof area of the building or buildings that are the subject of the review. Where a site includes a parking structure, the structure shall also have a solar energy system that covers at least 90% of its top level. The amendment identifies conditions where a solar energy system on the roof of the building or other structure is not required. The ARB can reduce or waive requirements when the applicant proposes and the ARB determines that there is a better alternative that meets the goal of this section. The amendment sets out regulations for emergency access and safety. Solar energy systems shall not be counted in determining the height and gross area of buildings. This amendment also covers solar, solar energy system placement. System placement cannot preclude a neighboring property owner from constructing, renovating, or expanding a building to the full extent allowed by zoning, even if the neighboring property owner's building would partially or fully shade the installed solar energy system. Nor can the placement of a solar energy system on a building, as required by this bylaw, require that a neighboring property owner prune an existing shade tree or abstain from planting a shade tree so as to prevent future shading in the installed solar energy system. This amendment is a significant step towards enacting policies recommended in the town's 2021 net zero action plan. The ARB voted five to zero at our April 4th meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 30. Thank you. Hello, I'm- Okay, and just a, a note briefly before we move on to the speaker queue, there was a, just make sure you, there's a message uh, from our staff in the chat uh, that there, the closed captioning function, which folks have been asking about in the QA, uh, is not functioning tonight. I apologize for that. Uh, but you can follow along, and there's a, a, a link to a website where you can follow the the, uh, uh, the, the, the real-time transcription there, and that's in the chat. Thank you. Uh, so let's uh, head to the, or, um, and tonight, again, because the uh, the chair of the redevelopment board is not able to join with us tonight, uh, she did give instruction, Ms. Zembury gave instructions that uh, Mr. Benson, uh, who's also a town meeting member, but also a member of the, of the ARB, can field questions specifically about these um, solar energy systems. So we can direct questions to him if we if we have uh, technical questions. Um, so let's uh, go to the speaker queue. Let's take uh, Mr. Rudick. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ben Rudick, Precinct 5. Um, first, let me say that as a new town meeting member, um, out of respect for town meeting, I have limited my speaking to only those issues where I feel I have some uh, professional perspective that would be valuable or a particularly uh, salient personal connection as with the uh, daycare um, warrant article previously. Um, in this case, I, I do have some professional perspective. Um, I have worked on the development of approximately 200 megawatts of utility scale solar uh, across several countries approximately. Um, half a million panels and am currently working on about 300 megawatts of additional um, development of solar projects. And so I have some idea about the um, field. Uh, overall, I think this is a tremendous um, change, a tremendous warrant article. Um, the last 10 plus years has seen extraordinary improvements in the viability of photovoltaic uh, solar energy. Uh, panel prices per watt have come down tremendously. Um, the, with a slight bump due to the trade war with China, um, uh, panel efficiencies have gone up. Uh, in short, uh, solar has become much more economically viable in many more places, which has further been improved by the uh, drop in um, lithium ion battery prices uh, and the ability to tie in storage um, in an economic way. Um, so I would say this is uh, wonderful, if not long overdue. Um, I have 
done my best to do my homework with regard to this article um, and read the accompanying reports, I was left with one question, um, namely about the um, ability of a building to meet the requirement by um, becoming solar ready, which I understand to um, have the roof be pre-wired and allow for additional loading, et cetera, to, to make the installation of a solar project uh, more straightforward. Um, from my experience, um, solar deployment is, is quite easy. Um, panels are not that heavy, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so I, I would just like additional, a bit more color, which I could not find in the um, report on, um, on why it was felt necessary to give um, that um, ability to, to satisfy this requirement with, just by becoming solar ready and not installing a system, which I, which I think would be a, um, a, a great thing to do um, if the, if the uh, roof can, um, is in the right position and so forth. Uh, I just like some additional color on that. Sure. Uh, so let, let's go to Mr. Benson on that. Uh, so, so why just the solar readiness and not going the full step to the installation? It's um, Eugene Benson, Precinct 10, and also Redevelopment Board member. This does require the installation of a solar system on the roof, unless it's an older building in which the roof doesn't have sufficient structural load capacity or if the roof is oriented in the wrong way so solar doesn't work. So it's more than simply making the roof solar ready. It actually requires uh, the installation and operation of a solar system. I see. Um, I guess the part I was confusing was the in the text where it says, you know, um, um, or be solar ready um, in parentheses. And so I, I just like to just clarify my understanding, um, which if it is, as you state, um, gets me uh, even more um, excited to support this, this article. Yeah, it, it's not just be solar ready. Um, this actually requires solar when if it, if it meets the requirements. I see. So, so just to be clear, like, there are some cases where it only requires to be solar ready, but that's not in all cases. No, no. It, it's either requires solar or it's exempted for one of the exemption reasons. Okay. Mr. Rudick, anything else? Okay, um, uh, I, I, I trust Gene uh, uh, extraordinarily and uh, uh, believe in his competence uh, um, to the utmost degree. So well, if that's what he says, I take him at his word. <laughs> okay, let, great. let me, I'll just read you the, the operative sentence. A project requiring environmental design review shall include a solar energy system that is equivalent to at least 50% of the roof area of, or the building or buildings that are subject to the review. And then it goes on from there. So it's not simply solar ready. It's actually a solar energy system. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Benson. You. Thank you, Mr. Rudick. Uh, let's take Mr. Leone next. My question was just answered. Okay, so it sounds like a pass. Reaching date. Okay, thank you. Uh, Let's take uh, Mr. Rosenthal next. Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. Um, this sounds like a wonderful idea, or at least it did and up until I heard uh, something in the presentation that has me a little worried. And so I'd like to clarify whether my understanding, whether I misunderstood or what, but I thought I heard that if I either have a pre-existing, uh, you know, solar panels on my on my roof, or if I build a new building um, and install solar panels on that, um, and you know, somebody in an adjacent property can build something higher that would shade my solar panels, turning that uh, investment, you know, making that investment far less valuable or potentially worthless, and I have no recourse. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, uh, Mr. Benson? Partially. It doesn't affect you and your house. So let's start there. This only affects buildings that um, require environmental design review and a special permit by the redevelopment board. So basically buildings on Mass Ave and Broadway that, you know, are mixed use or commercial buildings, things of that nature. 
And it does say that if um, one of those buildings is required to put solar on the roof, it doesn't stop a neighboring building from building taller. It doesn't stop a neighbor from planting a tree. We had to figure out what the right balance was between those and determine that the right balance was not to prevent future development. I anticipate that most of these buildings that um, will be coming before the zoning board will be three or four stories tall because that's what's allowed in those places. So it's pretty unlikely that they're going to be shaded by a later development. Okay, may I, may I ask Mr. Benson a follow-up question? Sure, sure. Um, how does this differ from what the rules are in uh, residential areas that you say are, uh, it sounds like there's already a set of rules for them. Um, how does this differ? Well, this, this, there's no requirement in residential areas to have solar. This establishes a requirement to have solar on a roof, again, for buildings that are subject to environmental design review by the redevelopment board. It doesn't require any single family homeowner to put solar on a roof. Um, what I'm asking is not so much about that, but rather <laughs> about uh, an owner of an adjacent property having the right to build something that um, casts a shadow on my solar panels. Uh, how does that differ uh, in the uh, in, in uh, what in what would be covered by uh, this uh, you know, by this article versus the what whatever the rules currently are in residential areas? Yeah. So well, actually, well, before we get into the details of that, it sounds like like this is just not within the scope of this article, which is. Um, uh, I'm just looking at the, the, the warrant article text, uh, but I, I'll actually, uh, well, the warrant article text is not restricted to um, business districts, does it? Well, it, if I might, Mr. Moderator, it does to the extent that it only applies to projects requiring an environmental design review. And um, mm -hmm. they are almost always in the business district. So, it does not have anything to do with Mr. Rosenthal's house if his next door neighbor wants to build, let's say, a dormer on top of the next door neighbor's house, which would shade Mr. Rosenthal's solar panel. It has nothing to do with that. So, so it, it, it is different, rules applied to, different rules apply to different districts, correct? Different rules apply to different districts. Different rules apply if it's one homeowner to another. Yeah. Great. Th thank you, Mr. Benson and Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Uh, let's take uh, Ms. Friedman. Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. Um, I have a, I'm a little confused about what buildings this would apply to um, because you mentioned those that we will require environmental uh, design review. Mm -hmm. I initially assumed that was new construction, but then you said something about older buildings also. It would apply to also to older buildings. And could you clarify how, um, exactly um, when an older building would be required to um, put solar panels on the roof rather than the just new construction? Yeah, an, an example would be an older building where they're doing a gut renovation and maybe putting an extra story on top of the building. That would be an example of one where they would be required as a result of the work they were doing to put a solar on. If, however, it's just a building, an older building, and again, it's going to be a commercial or a mixed use building generally, where they might be doing a change of use or the existing roof doesn't have the capacity to support solar, then they don't have to include it. Thank you very much. That's all, Mr. Moderator. Great, thank you, Ms. Friedman. Uh, let's take Ms. Malopchik next. And uh, by the way, if we do still have audio issues over Zoom, we, uh, we did find uh, the phone-in Zoom numbers, uh, uh, so we don't have to go through like 
speaker phones uh, like we did last time. Uh, Ms. Malovchik, are, are you able to use your microphone? Uh, let's see, can we put, um, can someone contact Ms. Malovchik or perhaps put it in the chat, like the, the phone in number? She says uh, not working in the Q&A. So while we get that resolved, let's take uh, Mr. Miller next. And we can circle back to Ms. Malofchik once we can uh, get a call going through. Yeah. Do, do, wait, do we have a call through at this point? Okay, we, we'll take that now. Sorry, Mr. Miller. Let, let's take uh, Ms. Malofchik uh, over. Yep. Beth Malofchik, Precinct 9. Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, I would like to know uh, the ARB's plans in working with Historic Districts Commission as it stands now, street facing roofs on homes in historic districts are prohibited from putting on solar panels. We had a, I'm on the Historic District Commission. We had a house come before us uh, in the last one or two years with a street facing roof, solar panel placement was not allowed. They were forced to put it on a rear, uh, different directional roof with less percentage of efficiency. With the state of the planet, I think uh, this needs to evolve. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, Mr. Benson, is that, uh... Is that covered by by this article? It, and it is. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah. There there is an exemption for a building in a historic district when the relevant historic district commission has denied a certificate of appropriateness, non applicability or hardship to allow the solar energy system. So, in other words, if the if it's a historic building in the district and the district says you can't put solar on, we're not, this does not authorize solar. If on the other hand, the historic district says, yes, it can go there, then it would require it. Yes, it can go there. Ms. Malofchik? Mr. Moderator, would you please ask uh, um, Mr. Benson what the ARB's plans are to work with the Historic District Commission to have them uh, evolve and modernize their protocols in the face of climate disaster. Uh, Mr. Benson, did you have desire to be net zero? Um, the ARB has not had that discussion. I actually think it's a very good discussion to have with the town's um, Clean Energy Future Committee, which is working on um, achieving the net zero plan. Thank you. Ms. Bolopczyk? Thank you very much. I hope that uh, town meeting will see that an appointment is set for a conversation at everyone's earliest convenience for that conversation. Thank you very much. Beth Bolopczyk, Precinct 9. Thank you, Ms. Bolopczyk. Uh, let's take Mr. Miller next. Name and precinct, please. Uh, Mr. Miller, are you able to unmute? <laughs> oh, I apologize, Mr. Moderator. No worries. Uh, thank you. Name and um, precinct, please. Yes, uh, Matthew Miller, precinct 11. Um, I, I don't have any issue with, um, you know, extending the solar exposure and preserving energy. That's obviously a, a good thing. Uh, my concern is related to uh, the pruning of trees by someone who is being directed by someone who doesn't own the property. Um, I'm sorry, my the, 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 the pruning of trees, was that, was that the verb pruning? Uh, what, what I believe I heard earlier was that uh, uh, an owner of a property who has a tree that could be blocking uh, solar energy panels could be required to prune their tree. Is that correct? Um, if, if I may, Mr. Yeah, moderator, please. no, it's the opposite. 
Mr. Miller. Um, it's very clearly stated that um, the placement of a solar energy system um, cannot require a neighboring property owner to prune an existing shade tree or from planting a shade tree. Uh, uh, just as a follow up on that, does that mean if the tree continues to grow and it's already been planted, would that require the owner of the property to prune that tree? Is no, there any... it, no, it does not. Oh, I, I see. Okay, that answers my question. Um, exactly. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Matthew Miller, Precinct 11. Thank you. Uh, let's take Mr. Moore next. Just FYI, we are at the 16 minute mark in debate. Mr. Moore, name Mr. Precinct. Moore, Precinct 14, motion to terminate debate. Oh, great timing. Um, uh, do we have a second to Mr. Moore's motion to terminate debate? Uh, we have a second for Mr. Hamlin. So let's open voting on termination of debate. And I see we also have a, a point of order from uh, Mr. Goodsell. So maybe we could take that up. Um, Hi, Mr. Moderator, Ian Goodsell, Precinct 11. Um, I just wanted to remind you that uh, back in session four, you had said that uh, you would be looking through the list to try and take people who don't speak very much. Um, the list of people that were ahead of me were uh, it's just a, a, a bunch of people that have um, spoken a lot. So I'm fine with uh, terminating the debate, but um, I'd, I'd like you to maybe take that into account in uh, future times. I'll, I'll try to do a better job of that. Thank you for the reminder, Mr. Goodsell. Thank you. Yeah. Um, voting here on termination debate of Article 30. If you're in favor of terminating debate, uh, vote yes. If you want to continue debate, vote no. This is a two thirds vote. We have just over 200 votes now. Okay, let's just give another say, 215. Let's just go another uh, 20 seconds before we close voting on termination of debate. 15 seconds. You could always use the Q&A if you're having trouble through the portal. 10 seconds. Five seconds as we close voting. Okay, let's close voting on termination of debate. And the motion passes 194 in the affirmative, 24 in the negative. Debate is terminated. Let's uh, open voting for the main motion. And so please wait for your uh, your wave of precinct uh, to have voting enabled. Oh, I, I meant to remind folks earlier, if you happen to have like something that might help with uh, these uh, uh, server connection issues um, that come up here with the people waiting for the tea, um, something that might help is if you have multiple uh, web browser windows open that are connected to the portal, uh, the town meeting portal, uh, that can create increased load on the system. So please, especially like, but if you have that the portal window open on mul multiple devices or just on one device, like a laptop, or maybe you have it open on, on a tablet also, if you can close those, uh, so you only have one window open to the portal, that would, um, that would be helpful, a, a web browser that you're connecting to the portal through, even if the, the, the even if the browser windows are in the background, they might still be connecting and uh, creating more load on the system. So we're voting now on the main motion of Article Thirty. Uh, 
this is this is a zoning bylaw amendment to allow uh, I'm sorry um, to allow for and require installation of solar energy systems for buildings subject to environmental design review. So if you're in favor of these zoning bylaw changes, uh, vote yes. If you're opposed, vote no. And this is a two thirds vote to amend the zoning bylaw. And we have 215 votes cast so far. Okay, let's uh, just wait another 30 seconds until we close voting on Article 30. If you're unable to go through the portal to enter your vote, you can use the Q&A. 20 seconds until we close voting. Ten seconds. Five seconds until we close voting. Okay, let's close voting on Article Thirty. Okay, and motion passes. Two hundred eight in the affirmative, sixteen in the negative. We'll just wait for the screens to go through since this is a main motion. Uh, to answer the question, there was a question in the Q and A about the multiple windows that I uh, mentioned. Uh, does that include the annotated warrant? That is, does not include the annotated warrant. That's a different system. Uh, this is the uh, the Arlington Town Meeting Portal that has like the maroon or brown colored buttons in it that you vote in and uh, request to speak in. Uh, this is not the Zoom window and it's not uh, the annotated warrant. Then after we're done going through these, looking through these screens, we're going to bring up, uh, we, we now have Article 32 before us. Okay, so let's bring up Article 32 now. Actually, before we do that, it is 929. Why, why don't we take a break now before we get into this? Um, and let's uh, let's come back at uh, 9.39, 10 minutes, uh, and we'll, we'll pick up at Article 32. Thank you.
George Floyd. Breonna Taylor. Ahmaud Arbery. Michael Lorenzo Dean. Eric Reven. Christopher McCoy. Christopher Whitfield. A Tatiana Jefferson. Dominique Clayton. Pamela Turner. Antoine Rose the second. Ronnell Foster. Stefan Clark. Aaron Bailey. Jordan Edwards. Paul O'Neill. Alteria Woods. Philando Castillo. Terrence Clutcher. Okay, it's 939, let's come back. And let's get into article 32. Uh, so let's bring up uh, Ms. Rate uh, to introduce article 32. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, Jennifer Wright, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I am introducing Article 32 on behalf of the ARB as their secretary ex officio, and I would like to request that the pre-recorded video presentation be shown to introduce this article. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rachel Zenberry, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, also known as the ARB, and I will be taking you through Warrant Article 32, bylaw amendment related to zoning, the Zoning Board of Appeals rules and regulations for the 2022 annual town meeting. In 2018, during the zoning bylaw recodification, administrative rules and processes were recommended to be removed from the bylaw. At that time, the Redevelopment Board's administrative rules and processes were removed. The ARB held a public hearing adopting its own rules and regulations. The Zoning Board of Appeals, or the ZBA, also adopted their own rules and regulations. However, Section 3.3 in the Zoning Bylaw continues to outline ZBA admin administrative procedures. The ZBA is the Arlington, only Arlington Board or Commission with rules codified in a town bylaw. The amended text includes the removal of the administrative rules and processes for the Zoning Board of Appeals from the Zoning Bylaw. This amendment aligns the practice of the Zoning Board of Appeals with that of other boards and commissions in town and aligns with the intent of the Zoning Bylaw recodification. The ARB voted 5 to 0 at their April 4th meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 32. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Hello, I'm Rachel Zimberry. Let's see. And uh, any questions that we have tonight, we can direct to either the chair of the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, the ZBA, uh, uh, Mr. Klein, or the vice chair, uh, Mr. Hanlon, if either of them are with us tonight. Um, this was on the consent agenda. It was removed by Mr. Rosenthal. Let's bring up Mr. Rosenthal, who also has uh, introduced a, um, a, at least a, has proposed a substitute motion. So Mr. Rosenthal, do you want to present that and move that substitute motion? Mark Rosenthal, Precinct 14. Can you hear me, Mr. Moderator? Yes, I can. Very good. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I move to amend Article 32 in accordance with the Rosenthal substitute motion. Uh, yes, I move to substitute, but that, that's close enough. Uh, we'll, we'll move to substitute. We have a motion to substitute. Uh, with the point of order from Mr. Goodsell, I see based on the timestamp on my screen is from before, so we can clear that. We have a second from uh, Mr. Weinstein. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Rosenthal, why don't you go ahead and introduce your substitute motion, and if we can bring that up on the screen so folks can see that while Mr. Rosenthal uh, introduces this. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Um, the ARB chair has said that the reason for Article 32 is to align the practice of the ZBA with that of other boards. She said that the ZBA is the only Arlington board with rules codified in a town bylaw. True, but the ZBA is also the only board that has to defend itself in front of the State Housing Appeals Committee when a 4DB developer appeals its ruling. And when I discussed the, this with town council, he acknowledged that the Housing Appeals Committee, otherwise known as the HAC, HAC, is, quote, an unfriendly forum, unquote, to zoning boards like our ZBA. Cleaning up bylaw language is a worthy effort when it removes superfluous language. 
but it should be done with care so that things put into the bylaw for good reason don't get swept away in the cleanup effort. For anyone wondering what 40B is, in a nutshell, there's a state law that allows developers to ignore local uh, zoning bylaws if a town hasn't met certain affordable housing goals. That's 40B. My substitute motion would preserve two important requirements that are actually already in the zoning bylaw. One is the requirement that 40B developers testifying before the ZBA do so under oath. The, the other requirement is that their testimony testimony be recorded. Neither of these requirements is onerous, especially nowadays when everybody with a cell phone has a video recorder in their pocket. This substitute motion also clarifies that the oath requirement is only intended to apply to, 40, to the 40B developer and not to residents who, residents who simply want to voice their opinions. When I spoke with town council, he explained that what typically happens with a 40B project is that a developer testifies before the ZBA, the ZBA agrees to allow the project uh, under certain conditions, and then the 40B developer goes to the, to the HAC and appeals those conditions. That, you know, the HAC, as I said, was, is the state body the town council describes as unfriendly to local zoning boards. And there may also be subsequent appeals to higher courts. Other towns had experienced 40B developers saying one thing in front of their zoning board and then something different in front of the hack. As a result, they added bylaw requirements that 40B developer testimony be given under oath and be recorded. The language in Arlington's bylaw that my substitution motion would preserve was modeled on those towns' bylaws. I learned that from the uh, former town meeting member who introduced uh, the article that turned into that language in the bylaws. The oath requirement was intended to apply only to the 40B developer, but that wasn't explicit in our bylaw. And I've learned that some ZBA members think the oath requirement applies to residents who just wanna give their opinion. I've been told that because of that, the ZBA hasn't been following the oath requirement, not even for the 40B developer. That's why I added a clause to make it unambiguous that only the 40B developers required to be sworn in. So to sum up, these oath and recording requirements don't place an onerous burden on the ZBA. The oath is likely to take a half a minute or less. The recording just requires somebody to take out their cell phone. These two simple actions will preserve testimony that could turn out to be important. Keeping these requirements in the zoning bylaw will insulate the ZBA from any pressure that developers might exert to get them to remove those requirements from the ZBA's own rules. So I ask you to please vote in favor of this substitute motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so uh, since uh, Mr. Rosenthal did cite uh, words from, um, uh, from Mr. Heim, I do wanna give Mr. Heim an opportunity uh, you know, to uh, either corroborate or uh, react to that since he was actually called out uh, by name. Uh, Mr. Heim, name or title. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Doug Heim, Town Council. Um, I think the summary that I would state with respect to this overall posture, and I won't speak for the Zoning Board of Appeals, which has its own representatives uh, here tonight, is that the uh, administration of oaths in a zoning board uh, proceeding is something that's already set forth in the zoning board's regulations. So that is true. Um, my understanding from Mr. Rosenthal, uh, after our uh, very nice discussions together, is that the original idea behind requiring an oath to be administered is that the HAC would not allow video recorded uh, testimony of some kind to be presented as evidence before them in a housing appeals because it was quote, not under oath. I'm not sure I understand the rationale uh, that, that I'm not doubting that this happened. I'm just not sure I understand the rationale. Usually when you administer an oath, the purpose is for there to be some later impeachment. In other words, some cross-examination would um, make it clear that someone was lying under oath or potentially some sort of prosecution for perjury. 
Um, both of those things are pretty unlikely to happen in this scenario, which is something that I also relayed to Mr. Rosenthal because of the uh, nature of the forum, which mostly relies on pre-file testimony. If somebody manifestly lies before the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, it's certainly something that can be presented to the HAC, but the odds that there's gonna be some penalty for a perjury or that there would be some meaningful opportunity to impeach them uh, because it is, is, is slim. It's not a jury trial, it's not even a bench trial. It's an administrative appeal. It really speaks more to the weight of uh, what a developer or anybody else is saying. The only other thing I wanna comment on that I did add for Mr. Rosenthal is that, um, well, two quick things. One is, is that- uh, very, very quick, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Moderator, if I'm speaking too much, let me know. Oh, no, 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 just, 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 I want you to be able to finish your thoughts. Go ahead. Okay. The only other two things that I think would be helpful for town meeting um, to understand is that um, the uh, chapter 40B uh, generally trumps chapter 40A, which is uh, one of the things that I think a lot of people um, uh, complain about uh, because uh, it's designed to do that. So to the extent that there's an inconsistency with chapter 40B, uh, in chapter 40A or any local bylaw, um, the HAC, for, in, for in part for reasons I outlined in Mr. Rosenthal, is likely to say that, well, you can't apply a requirement to a chapter 40B permit that's not required of a chapter 40A uh, permit. Now, um, town meeting can take that for what, it, what it's worth, but I suppose what I'm trying to get at is, um, I, I don't know the, the, the actual practicality of uh, having a zoning bylaw provision that preserves this. Uh, whether or not the ZBA should be administering this oath pursuant to their own internal regulations is kind of a separate matter. And then finally, um, with respect to um, the uneven application of oaths, I do understand what Mr. Rosenthal is getting at. I think the chair of the ZBA could speak better to uh, concern about asking people testifying um, as residents under oath uh, but that, that may propose, pose some problems for attorney general review. Um, if you are basically saying that only one set of folks have to uh, have a both administered to them in a hearing and not others, I'm not 100% sure how um, that would be treated um, uh, by the attorney general's office. And I, I did try to note that for Mr. Rosenthal, but I, I, I recognize that I was a little bit tardy in providing him uh, that perspective after speaking to our special counsel on 40B matters. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, Town Meeting, for indulging me. Appreciate it. Right, thank you, Mr. Hunt. Uh, let's go to the uh, speaker queue now. Let's um, let's take Ms. Bloom. Nancy Bloom, Precinct 18. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Ms. Bloom. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Uh, I was reading through Mr. Jameson's notes about the various articles my understanding from, the, from what i read from him was that the current zoning bylaw as well as mr rosenthal's amendment might both not be in compliance with state law i may have misunderstood that but i wanted to clarify uh, i mean i don't believe so because these have both been vetted by uh, town council mr heim mr heim do you want to confirm the uh, what the uh, legality of the main motion and the substitute motion thank you mr moderator doug heim town council I, I may be mistaken but i think what Ms. bloom and mr jameson may be talking about is whether or not you can require an administration of oath in a 40b context if you don't require it in a 40a context in other words, the law generally says you're not allowed to treat 40B, this is a little bit of a, of a summary statement, but generally you're not allowed to treat 40B applications in a way that's materially different from the way you treat a 40A application. 48, 40B being the comprehensive permit, 40A being most other types of relief under the zoning bylaw, special permits for more typical projects, et cetera. So I think that's what Mr. Jamison is, is referencing. Um, obviously, the Attorney General's Office passed the zoning bylaw as it currently exists. So to the extent that Mr. Rosenthal's amendment seeks to keep something that's already there, the Attorney General's Office will not review that. Um, I, I, my, that, is, that is my uh, best summary of the posture that's, that's somewhat complicated and probably dates back quite some time. Thank you. Ms. Bloom? 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. And so let's take uh, uh, Mr. Klein next. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Christian Klein, uh, Precinct 10, also chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, appreciate this opportunity to speak uh, to, the, to the meeting on this article. <clears throat> So at the time of the recodification back in 2018, the ZBA had a set of comprehensive rules and per, uh, regulations that were in effect since 2016, but it had never had a set of regular rules and regulations. And so at the time it was decided to keep the rules and regulations that were codified in the zoning bylaw as the rules and regulations of the board and the, the board actually voted to approve that. Um, subsequently, the board has generated its own set of rules and regulations for uh, regular hearings for 40A hearings and uh, adopted those. So now we have rules and regulations for both 40A and 40B, and they are both uh, available on the ZBA website. Um, <clears throat> the reason that the board put this article forward, as Ms. Embury had noted in her video presentation, was that the Zoning Board of Appeals, that the, the section in the zoning bylaws that outlines specific rules for the Zoning Board of Appeals is no longer required as the Zoning Board of Appeals has adopted its own rules and regulations. And the Zoning Board of Appeals um, adopts rules and regulations under Chapter 40A, Section 12 of Massachusetts General Laws, whereby the Zoning Board of Appeals shall adopt rules not inconsistent with the provisions of the zoning ordinance or bylaw for the conduct of its business and for purposes of this chapter. And as such, um, in my conversation with Mr. Jamison, I feel that the section, uh, the subsection A in our current zoning bylaws is essentially um, in opposition to allowing the Zoning Board of Appeals to adopt its own rules and regulations. Um, at present, if we wanna change the rules and regulations as they are presented in the zoning bylaw, we are not allowed to do so on our own. We have to uh, get the approval of the redevelopment board to put them onto the town meeting warrant, and then we have to get a two thirds vote of town meeting to amend our articles, um, excuse me, our rules and regulations. Um, specifically in regards to 40B, um, the 40B process, comprehensive permit process is a very complicated and very lengthy process of review. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals met six times more last year than the select board did. Um, and that is because we had two comprehensive permit hearings running simultaneously and during those times, the board did not request that the applicants speak under oath. The rules, the what's written in the zoning bylaws uh, requires that anyone who speaks before the Zoning Board of Appeals is required to speak under oath. And it was my opinion um, and in, in speaking with counsel that that requirement would stifle the free expression of the neighbors. And it is critical in a hearing like this where there is extensive um, impacts that are on the town and on the residents that the residents feel free to fully express all of their concerns um, that occur um, in regards to the application. Any piece of testimony that is provided by the applicant um, comes by way of their team of engineers. The Zoning Board of Appeals has its own set of consulting engineers that are fully funded. They take every single piece of information. They fully vet every single piece of information that is provided. They provide guidance back to the board. They provide guidance back to the applicant. There's a bit of uh, go in between, between the two groups. Um, and so there is no testimony that is provided that is not vetted. Whether or not it is specifically given under oath, there is no piece of information that is handed to the board that is taken um, at face value without full review. Um, I would also note that the Zoning Board of Appeals decision um, in, on the previous two cases uh, that came before it that were going for uh, seeking comprehensive permits, uh, one proceeded without an appeal to the HAC. Um, the one for Thorndike Place was submitted for a, um, an appeal under for the HAC, and it is, I would also note that that appeal has been with, has the request to withdraw the appeal has been provided by the applicant. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals takes great pride in the work it does, and we feel it's important that that be reflected in giving the board the ability to manage its own rules and regulations for the operation of its business. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Um, let's take uh, Mr. Warden next.
name and precinct, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, um, thank you. Uh, go ahead. The different sort of setup than it has been. Um, okay, yeah, John Worden, precinct eight. Um, uh, be, be very brief. <clears throat> um, at, at this stage uh, of, of the uh, uh, where, where we're at with, with respect to 40B, um, um, unless the select board members uh, are going to do the right thing and the next time a 40B developer comes along say, no, we have our one and a half percent uh, devoted to uh, affordable housing uh, and uh, therefore we, we, don't, we don't have to allow you to override our zoning. They can do that. They, they, um, they did it with the original Mugar project um, and, and it turned out that their calculations were a little bit off. They did not do it with the MyRight project for some reason, um, but now surely we, we have that, we, we have that one and a half percent, although for some reason they haven't been very diligent or planning whoever is not very diligent about nailing that down. Uh, if, if they're gonna do that, then, then, then we're fine because then the developer, whoever he is, is gonna have to uh, go through the regular process like everybody else does. Um, but if, we, if they don't, then it's, I think it's very important that, that, that we, have this, um, we have this provision, which is, uh, as Mr. Rosenthal noted, has been um, in, in, in several other towns and it's, uh, uh, it, it's been approved by the Attorney General. And just because there are also rules and regulations that the Zoning Board has enacted, uh, as they're authorized to do, uh, doesn't mean that we can't have a, a parallel um, uh, requirement uh, in the in, in the bylaw itself uh, that, that both deals with the the, uh, the the testimony by the applicant under oath and the and the um, uh, the recording of the thing the recording of that of that testimony uh, because frankly um, well in my opinion forty B developers are typically not very nice people. And be, if they were nice people, well, let's let's, come into our let's not make uh, uh, cast aspersions on entire classes of people or their career choices here. Uh, okay, uh, I, I I would say that, um, um, in my opinion, nice people when they come to Arlington say we we we, we will build, we want to do our project. Tell us what your zoning your zoning laws are, and we we will follow your regulations. 40B developers don't do that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Let's take Mr. Wagner next. Uh, next, excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. I move to terminate debate on the article in all matters. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. Wagner to terminate debate. Uh, do we have a second? Okay, we have a... Uh... Uh, a second from Mr. Granucci. So let's uh, bring up a vote for terminating debate on Article 32 and Mr. Rosenthal's substitute motion. Okay, vote, voting should be open or opening, depending on which wave of precinct you're in. And so if you see the yellow highlighted text that you're in a future wave, uh, just sit tight. Uh, if you do not see the yellow highlighted text, but you see a button to cast your vote, please cast your vote. And so we're voting on whether to terminate debate on Article 32 and uh, Mr. Rosenthal's substitute motion. So if you're in favor of terminating debate, vote yes. If you want to continue debate, uh, vote no.
We have almost 200 votes cast, so let's wait a little bit longer. Still have over 20 outstanding uh, votes that we're waiting for. Okay, we're at the 216. Let's just wait another 30 seconds for termination of debate of Article 32. 20 seconds. 15 seconds until we close voting on termination debate of the main motion and the substitute. Uh, five seconds. Okay, let's close voting. There's a two thirds vote and the motion passes. 183 in the affirmative, 34 in the negative. So debate is terminated um, on the main motion and all the matters before it, which is the substitute motion. So let's bring up voting now on the substitute motion. For Article 32, Mr. The, uh, the Rosenthal substitute motion. Uh, did it say two thirds vote because the um, substitute motion should be, and double check this, but it, it should be a majority vote. So let, let's hold off on that. Um, subsidiary motions. Uh, amend or substitute, yeah, it's, it's always majority. Uh, can we correct that before we proceed? Sorry, we didn't catch that before when these were entered into the system. Uh, can we close the voting and uh, and re-enter this, as, if that's possible, re-enter this as, as a majority vote, just so there's no confusion when the voting screen comes up? Apologies for that. Again, sorry, we didn't catch that earlier. Uh, motions to amend and substitute are always majority, regardless of whether the main motion is majority, two thirds, you know, eight ninths, it doesn't matter. I don't want to get to the end of the vote and we're looking at the voting screens and the display says one thing and I'm verbalizing another. Let's make sure that's consistent. Okay, so we're back to voting now on uh, the Rosenthal substitute motion. It says amend, but substitute and amend are um, procedurally equivalent um, as far as voting goes. Uh, so this is uh, now correctly states that it is a majority vote to substitute Mr. Rosenthal's substitute motion in place of the main motion. So uh, the waves of voting are still kind of rolling out. So if you see the yellow highlighted text, just please wait for your chance to vote. Uh, if you see a cast your vote button on your screen and in your uh, voting portal, please, uh, please vote. And so we're voting here on whether to substitute Mr. Rosenthal's substitute motion in place of the main motion. If you wish to substitute Mr. Rosenthal's um, substitute motion, uh, uh, vote yes. Uh, if you want to leave the main motion not substituted, then vote no. Again, a no vote means to retain the main motion as it was originally written. Again, this is a majority vote. The main, the main motion will be a two thirds vote, but we're not there yet. Okay, so we have 213 votes, 215 votes cast now. Um, uh, let's, just, let's just wait another 30 seconds until we close voting on whether to substitute Mr. Rosenthal's substitute motion. Uh, 25 seconds. 20 seconds. Until we close voting on the substitute motion. Uh, 15 seconds, 10 seconds, five seconds. 
Okay, let's close voting on the substitute motion. Remember, this is a majority vote and the vote fails. Uh, 54 in the affirmative, 162 in the negative. Uh, so we'll wait for these screens since it's a substitute motion. We're only skipping this, the voting screens for termination of debate. And then after we cycle all uh, through these uh, these precinct screens, uh, we'll then open voting on the main motion um, without substitution. Okay, let's uh, let's open voting now on the main motion for Article Thirty Two. Now this will be a two thirds vote. Okay, so voting should now start rolling out for the main motion of Article 32. Okay, again, if you're seeing the yellow highlighted text in your voting window, uh, that just means that your, your wave of precincts uh, has not had voting enabled yet. So just sit tight and it'll open up momentarily. Uh, if you see a cast vote button, uh, feel free to vote and please get your vote in quickly. Uh, there's a request in the Q&A to show the language of the article. Can we bring that up while we're waiting for the votes to come in? So yeah, there's a lot of text here, so it might be hard to fit it on screen at a font size that folks are going to be able to read. Um, So if we can scroll down to the vote language, since that's technically what's changing or that what's being proposed to change in the zoning bylaw. Okay, thank you. And just a reminder, this is a two thirds vote for the main motion to zoning bylaw change related to the rules and regulations for the zoning board of appeals. And we have uh, 212 votes in. We're still waiting for several more to come in. If you're able to vote in the voting portal, please do. Okay, okay let's uh, keep voting open for another 30 seconds. If you're not able to vote in the portal, you can always uh, enter your vote, type it into the Q&A in Zoom. 20 seconds until we close voting on the main motion of Article 32. Ten seconds. Last chance to vote. Five seconds until we close voting. Okay, let's close voting on Article 32. And the vote passes. Uh, 174 in the affirmative, 45 in the negative. We'll just wait for the screens to run through all the precincts. Article 32 is now closed. We'll just wait for the screens now. And then after we're done uh, seeing the votes across all the precincts, we'll open up uh, Article 33.
Okay, so let's uh, let's now go to uh, Article Thirty Three. And this has a, a recommended vote of favorable action from the redevelopment board. Um, let's see, who shall we bring up? Let's bring up, um, uh, can we bring up uh, Mr. Klein to introduce this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Uh, chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I believe that uh, Ms. Embry has prepared a video presentation on this article. I believe there is. Could we bring that up? Thank you. Hello, I'm Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, also known as the ARB. And I will be taking you through Warrant Article 33, a bylaw amendment related to the definition of half story for the 2022 annual town meeting. Between 2018 and 2021, this section of the bylaw related to the definition of half story has been updated multiple times to provide clarity and to align with the definition in the state building code. The purpose of this amendment is to improve and clarify the existing definition of half story. This amendment was brought to the ARB by the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Zoning Bylaw Working Group. The text of the amendment includes specifying that the area comprising half story is calculated on the finished floor or story below, not including porches and decks. This definition ensures consistent interpretation by the ZBA, applicants, staff, and the general public. This amendment provides clarity to the zoning bylaw and does not alter the substance of the bylaw. The ARB voted five to zero at our April 4th meeting to rec recommend favorable action on Article 33. Thank you. Okay, Hello, so, I'm Rachel Zenberry. Okay, Hello. Okay. This, this was on the consent agenda. It was uh, uh, requested to be removed by uh, Ms. Phelan. Uh, can we bring Ms. Phelan up? Um, she could be our first speaker. And Your moderator. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry, Mr. Klein, did you have more to say? I'm sorry. I, I did. I beg your pardon. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Moderator, again, Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Um, essentially, the reason for bringing this is that there, there's a slightly, there, there was some confusion as to how the, the second part of this is to be um, interpreted, which is the reason for bringing forward the article. Um, the numerator in the equation um, remains absolutely the same. The question is just what is the denominator? Um, and there has been some confusion as to what was meant by um, in the prior definition. And what this clarifies is that when you're calculating a half story for the um, for the the third level of a building, it is relative to the gross floor area of the second floor. Um, because and that is the reason for this article. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and apologies for cutting off your time. Uh, let's uh, bring up uh, Ms. Phelan, who. Uh, asked to remove this from the consent agenda. Hi, Mr. Moderator, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Name and precinct? Michelle Phelan, Precinct 4. Um, the uh, chart and explanation have answered my questions, and I'm all set with this. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, do we have any other speaker? We have no other speakers, so let's go straight to voting. Okay, so we're opening up voting now. This is the main motion of Article 33, um, uh, which changes, which seeks to change the zoning bylaw to update the definition of half story. So, if you are in favor of this change, vote yes. And can we can we bring up the uh, the change uh, on screen? Article 33. And if you are not in favor of this change in definition of half story, you can vote no. And this is a two thirds vote to amend the zoning bylaw.
know, the, the waves of precincts, like the voting, the waves of voting should be all opened up for all precincts at this point. Yeah, we have uh, just over 200 votes. Yeah, we're still waiting for several votes to go. If you're like everyone should be able to vote at this point. If you have uh, problems voting in the portal, you can enter your vote uh, by typing it into the Q and A, and we'll have someone enter it for you. Let's just give folks another, another 30 seconds before we close voting on Article 33. Okay, 20 seconds until we close voting. Ten seconds. Five seconds until we close voting. Okay, let's close voting on Article 33, the main motion. It's a two-thirds vote, and it passes. 209 in the, in the affirmative, six in the negative. So just wait for all the screens uh, to show the votes from all the precincts. And once we've finished cycling through these screens with uh, Article 33 disposed of, we'll, we'll open up Article 34, which is in front of us. We'll just finish watching all the votes from all the precincts first. Okay, so let's, uh, let's now bring up Article 34. Uh, it's a zoning bylaw uh, amendment related to porches. This was also on the consent agenda. Um, it was pulled off, it's a two thirds vote. Um, so let's, um, uh, uh, Mr. Klein, do you, do you wanna speak to this, to introduce this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christian Klein, Precinct 10, Chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, I would ask that the video presentation prepared by the Arlington Redevelopment Board be played. Okay, let's bring that up. Hello, I'm Rachel Zenberry, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, also known as the ARB, and I will be taking you through Warrant Article 34, a bylaw amendment related to the definition of porch for the 2022 annual town meeting. This amendment was brought to the ARB by the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Zoning Bylaw Working Group in response to frequent re requests for a special permit under section 5.3.9 by property owners seeking to construct a farmer's porch or similar structure. The text of the amendment includes, Texas specifies that the porches are included in the consideration of projections into a minimum front yard setback and clarification that porches are subject to section 5.3.9.A for the ZBA applicants, staff, and the general public. This amendment provides clarity to the zoning bylaw and does not alter the substance of the bylaw. The ARB voted five to zero at our April 4th meeting to recommend favorable action on article 34. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Mr. Moderator, Klein, do you have anything else to add? 
I, I do thank you again, Christian Klein, Precinct 10, um, Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. So essentially, currently, we the board receives many applications looking for adding a farmer's porch, a large porch on the front of a house. And the um, inspectional services has um, considered them to be enclosed entrances uh, for the purposes of this uh, section um, in order for them to, to be considered. Um, this is a, such a common feature in Arlington that we felt it was better to include it specifically um, under this section of the bylaw and then to amend the definition of porches to clarify that a porch is unenclosed and open it to the elements to differentiate it from um, a porch which would be enclosed. Um, and this, this article is brought forth in conjunction with Article 35, which has already been passed by this, um, this meeting, whereby um, the enclosure of a porch would require a, spe a separate special permit. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I did mention this was, was uh, pulled off the consent agenda uh, by Ms. Leahy, but she did contact me before the meeting to say that that was unintentional. She intended that as a second, uh, not, uh, and so, um, uh, so there's actually, she doesn't need to speak, but um, uh, we do have someone in the speaking queue. Let's take uh, Mr. Slotnick. Larry Slotnick, uh, Precinct 7. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. So I, I just would like to clarify uh, or, or point out what's happening in East Arlington. And, and I think there might be some relevance to this. Uh, when developers purchase two family homes, they often uh, to not exceed FAR uh, limits, um, dismantle existing porches on two family houses and then basically bring uh, the front of the house, uh, you know, the, the rebuilt building closer to the sidewalk or closer to where was the original porch uh, on the house. So we're we're finding these uh, these luxury F FAR just for the benefit of me the floor area ratio correct? Yeah, floor area ratio. So we're we're finding these uh, you know kind of super luxury developments having no front porches anymore. That the you know the developer has been able to add a few hundred square feet to the second and first floor of the building because they now enclose them and they're under air conditioning and heating. Um, and so I'm just wondering if, if these condominium owners typically will now be able to petition to, to put an open front porch onto the house again. Uh, Mr. Klein, do you have an answer? Uh, thank you, Christian Klein, um, Chair of the Arlington Zone and Board of Appeals. So currently the, the reason that those porches are allowed to be enclosed by right, um, was uh, an interpretation under the zoning bylaw that those are already considered enclosed because they have a roof on them. Um, and as, as I mentioned previously, under Article 35, which was previously approved by this by this meeting, um, that is no longer allowed by right, that is allowed by special permit. Uh, so there will be some oversight of those enclosures. Um, and then the request to add a porch on the front uh, would require a special permit because it would be constructed within the setback. Okay. All right, that answers my question. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Slotnick. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Um, let's take, uh, we haven't heard from Mr. Hanlon tonight. Let's take Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Name and precinct, please. Uh, my name is Pat Hanlon. I'm room precinct five. Uh, and I'm also a uh, <clears throat> member of the Zoning Board of Appeals and have written most of the opinions in the last year or so. Uh, we get a lot of cases that rate, relate to uh, the intrusion of porches into uh, the front, the projection of the porches into the, uh, usually the front uh, mandated yard. Those cases mostly, although not entirely, mostly are people seeking to create porches and they're ordinary folks, just like uh, all the people here. They're not developers. They're people who are looking forward to 
uh, doing something that maybe makes the street a little bit more interesting and something that makes the uh, that gives them a place to sit during the summertime uh, to watch children and so forth. That's the kind of justification we hear. Um, there is almost never any opposition to this. Uh, these are very uncontroversial things. They, obviously, something could be controversial. Uh, someone could try to abuse this, but that hasn't generally uh, been the case. Uh, we have typically included a condition uh, that requires uh, that the application, that the porch not be enclosed, uh, but for, uh, it more or less in line with the bylaw that we'll come to next. Uh, and we've put in a condition that uh, the porch doesn't redefine what the foundation wall is so that it doesn't provide a way for sort of creeping enlargement of the structure. And that system has worked out pretty well. But the difficulty is that the uh, language of the bylaw on which we rely in, in rendering these decisions is something that at the very least is subject to uh, uh, subject to question, and in a spirit of transparency, which I think we and ISD are both working towards uh, uh, now as a major priority, we really would like to be clear that the bylaw authorizes what it is that it is a longstanding practice uh, to do. Um, and so you will see, and the body will see a number of amendments that are designed to do provide for clarifications in just this way, uh, because the, the zoning bylaw is complicated enough, and it ought to be true that when you read the bylaw, what you read clearly justifies what actually happens in practice. Um, and so the, the board has asked uh, for an, a clarification of the bylaw to make clear uh, that the porches can, that are pretty uncontroversial and in accordance with town policy uh, can proceed as they have been doing in the past. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Uh, and yeah, th this comment is not directed at any anyone individually, but I just want to remind folks that this this article was removed from the consent agenda, apparently unintentionally. Um, so let's just keep that in mind as we uh, uh, go through debate. Um, so I see no more speakers in the speaker queue. So let's go straight to voting on Article 34. Okay, so we're now opening voting on Article 34. If you're seeing that yellow highlighted text that your voting controls will be enabled in a future wave, uh, just sit tight. Uh, that'll open up um, momentarily. Uh, if you see a cast vote button, please go ahead and vote. Um, we're voting on the main motion of Article 34. Um, uh, so you'd want, uh, vote yes if you want to change the zoning bylaw to update the definition of a porch. Uh, vote no if you don't want to change the definition of a porch. If you just don't want to change the zoning bylaws in this regard, uh, can we bring up the uh, the text of the or the um, from the annotated warrant the um, the voting language for Article Thirty Four, please? And this is a two thirds vote. So you can see the edits there or the proposed changes to the zoning bylaw under vote language on the screen here. The underlined text being added, the stricken text being removed. So if you're in favor of these changes to the Zoning by law, vote yes to change the definition of a porch. Uh, if you disapprove of this change, vote no. Okay, we're at 212 votes cast, 215. Uh, still several outstanding. Now up to 218, let's just wait another 30 seconds and then we'll close voting on Article 34.
Okay, 20 seconds left. So we close voting, 15 seconds. If you can't get it through the voting portal, you can do it through the chat. I'm sorry, through the Q&A, 10 seconds. Five seconds until we close voting. Okay, let's close voting on Article 34. Main motion. Okay, it passes 216 in the affirmative, six in the negative. We'll just wait for the screens to cycle. And so Article 34 is closed. And while we're waiting for these screens, um, let's see. Next up is Article 36. The way we're getting through these zoning uh, articles, it's as if everyone's racing to get to 38. Um, um. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Rachel. Thanks for queuing that up. Um, Okay, so let's now bring up Article 36, which is before us. And um, let's see, Mr. Klein, do you want to introduce this as well? Uh, certainly. Uh, Christian Klein, Precinct 10, uh, Chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I ask that the video presentation by the Arlington Redevelopment Board be displayed. Okay, let's bring that up. And uh, while we're bringing that up, also, I just want to. Uh, let folks know this was also on the consent agenda. It was moved, removed by Ms. Band, but uh, she no longer wishes uh, to speak to the article. Uh, actually, before we get to the video, we do have a point of order from Mr. Hanlon. So let's take that before we get into the video. Mr. Moderator, um, I, I, we just did number 34, and I thought that was number 35 on the uh, Article 35 was on the, was on the consent after agenda. the consent agenda. I see. Okay. I would draw the burner order. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, so let's go back to the video. Thank you. Hello, I'm Rachel Zenberry, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, also known as the ARB, and I will be taking you through Warren Article 36 related to large additions for the 2022 Annual Town Meeting. This amendment was brought to the ARB by the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Zoning Bylaw Working Group and eliminates dual and potentially conflicting requirements in the zoning bylaw and improves clarity for the ZBA, applicants, staff, and the general public. The text of the amendment includes clarification of the calculation by which the determination of a large addition is made, specification that the more restrictive, more restrictive requirements apply. This amendment provides clarity to the zoning bylaw and does not alter the substance of the bylaw. The ARB voted five to zero at our April 4th meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 36. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Klein, do you have anything to add? Uh, just thank you, Mr. Moderator Christian Klein, Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, just very briefly, the bylaw has always indicated that a large addition is either 750 square feet or 50% of the existing area of the house, um, but it never said whether it was the larger or the lesser of those two. And so this clarifies that it's the lesser. And then there has also been a longstanding interpretation by the inspectional services that when you are considering the area of an addition, the portion of that that falls within the existing footprint of the house does not count towards the calculation of a large addition. This is because section 813A, which deals with um, non existing non conforming buildings um, very specifically uh, notes that anything within the existing footprint um, is not considered detrimental. And so, uh, for this reason, because this is the general interpretation and it is not necessarily clear, we wanted to make sure that it was clear in this revision that the portion of a um, of an addition that falls within the footprint of the house does not count towards the calculation of a large addition. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Klein. I, I see, by the way, from uh, the, I, I can see the time script, time stamp on the point of order on my screen. That is a, uh, an obsolete point of order from a few minutes ago. Thank you. And so, um, do we have any speakers? Let's give folks a second in case their displays are slow to update. 
Okay, so I don't see any speakers in the queue. And so let's go straight to voting on Article 36. Okay, so voting is opening up. You might see yellow highlighted text saying that you're in a future wave. So just sit tight if you're seeing that. Uh, if you see a cast vote button, please proceed to vote. And this is a two thirds vote uh, for changing the zoning bylaw to update the definition of large additions. So if you're in favor of that change, and can we bring up the, uh, the text of that change, please? If you're in favor of that change in definition of a large addition, vote yes. If you're opposed, vote no. And this is a two thirds vote to amend the zoning bylaw. Okay, we have uh, just around 190 votes cast so far. Still waiting for several more. Two hundred votes cast. Two ten. All right, two fourteen. Let's give folks another thir uh, thirty seconds until we close voting on Article uh, Thirty Six. 20 seconds until we close voting. Ten seconds. Okay, let's uh, close voting on our, the main motion of Article Thirty Six. And the vote passes 210 in the affirmative, five in the negative. We'll just wait for the screens to go by to show all the votes from all the precincts. Okay, that's the seventh article that we've disposed of tonight. If we dispose of one more, we'll break our record at this annual town meeting. That would be exciting. Also, if we finish Article 37 tonight, um, then we can start uh, next Wednesday with a clean slate with Article 38, which I know has a, uh, a lot of uh, interest. Okay, so let's now uh, bring up Article 37. Uh, zoning bylaw amendment for uh, unsafe structures. Uh, and let's see, let's bring up uh, Mr. Chapa, the Director of um, Inspectional Services. Uh, do, we have, do we have Mr. Chapa with us tonight? If we don't, can we bring up um, uh, uh, Ms. Raitt? Jennifer Raitt, Director of Planning and Community Development. I'm introducing Article 37, and on behalf of the ARB, I'd like to request that the pre recorded video presentation be played. Thank yeah, you. Bring up the video. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Hello, I'm Rachel Zenberry, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, also known as the ARB, and I will be taking you through Warren Article 37, a bylaw amendment for unsafe structures in the 2022 annual town meeting. 
This amendment was brought to the ARB by the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Zoning Bylaw Working Group and establishes who may determine whether a structure is unsafe. This responds to instances where a contractor has removed a portion of a building without consulting the, inspection, the inspectional services department. Inappropriate determinations in the past have led to portions of a structure being rebuilt that would otherwise not be allowed. The text of the amendment includes clarification that the director of inspectional services or their designee must make the determination that a structure is unsafe prior to demolition. This amendment provides clarity to the zoning bylaw and does not alter the substance of the bylaw. The ARB voted five to zero at our April 4th meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 37. Thank you. Hello, I'm David Pre Hello. Okay, so uh, this was on the, uh, Mr. Klein, or actually uh, Ms. Wright, did you, did you have anything further to add? No, Mr. Moderator, I do not have anything further to add. Okay, thank you. Um, so this was on the consent agenda. It was uh, requested by Ms. Mazina to remove it. So, and I see Ms. Mazina's in the speaking queue. So let's take uh, uh, Ms. Mazina first since she requested uh, that we take this off the consent agenda. Ms. Mazina, name and precinct. Hi, Mr. Moderator, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Angel Mazina, uh, precinct 15. Um, I requested to remove this from the consent agenda and did follow up with uh, Mr. Klein on this piece about uh, the need to clarify this addition to the bylaw when it's already uh, contained in articles 30 of the zoning bylaws. The inspectional services director is already um, uh, has the authorization to do so and it's, uh, it's outlined in the bylaws. I thought it was sort of a duplication, unnecessary duplication, but perhaps I don't believe I've heard back from, Ms., uh, uh, from Mr. Klein. And so Mr. Moderator, if you'd like to ask uh, Mr. Klein for clarification, um, that'd be helpful. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Klein, do you have a cl uh, clarification or answer for Ms. Mazina's question? Uh, thank you, Christian Klein, uh, Precinct 10, Chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I would apologize to Ms. Mazina if I uh, did not respond to her earlier um, question. Uh, the reason for including it in in this section specifically is um, when the bylaws are reviewed by uh, various parties, people are not always um, consistent in, in reading the entire document. And we did have a very unfortunate incident where a contractor uh, who was directed to leave two walls of an existing house intact uh, decided that they were unsafe and demolished it and essentially left the owner without a house on a non-developable lot. Um, we were able to uh, to remedy the situation through the issuance of a variance, but it was you know it was a very disturbing for the owner of the house to realize all of a sudden their house was gone. So we felt it was important to include this provision in this section specifically because this is where a contractor would look to determine what their rights would be. Ms. Mazina. Uh, you're, uh, Ms. Mazzino, you're muted. Oh, there you go. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Then in that case, um, if I am allowed to move uh, to amend from the floor here, um, just to clarify that this is um, reflecting the authorization due under uh, Mass General Laws. So I am okay with that addition as long as we hearken or relate back to the authority granted by the statute. Uh, in Mass General Law. So adding perhaps Mr. Klein, if you would be uh, open to that, just adding that clarification in that sentence. Just so we, un we understand we are not overriding here state law, but actually just clarifying and uh, putting in that reference. Um, I mean, I, my understanding, I'm not an attorney. And my understanding is that, well, we can't have uh, uh, zoning bylaws that override state law. There's home rule petitions uh, that we can make. Uh, let's bring up, uh, Mr. Heim, uh, is, is this legally uh, necessary or meaningful? Doug Heim, Town Council. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. You're correct. We cannot override state law by operation of our bylaws. Our bylaws certainly, in theory, can clarify that we are following state law, but the default should always be that our bylaws would be interpreted consistent with state law. Thank you. Right, and so, so given the, the, the subtlety of this, um, um, I am, 
uh, inclined to not entertain a motion to amend at this point uh, that there uh, if there, I mean, there there was an opportunity um, to submit that in advance and um, um, so I, I'm not going to entertain that motion at this time on the floor. So, uh, Mr. Moderator, if I could hear Mr. Klein's uh, opinion on that, that'd be helpful. Sure. Uh, Mr. Klein? Um, thank you, Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Um, Ms. Mazzita, are you saying that this is in regards to Mass General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 3, is your concern? Ms. Mazzina? That's correct, as I had indicated in our exchange. Okay, because... Um, my in reviewing chapter 40a section three the term unsafe does not occur in that section so i'm just curious if you were considering a different section uh, no actually i stand corrected um the uh the section that i'm referring to is chapter 143 section six that grants the director of inspectional services the authority to oversee and determine the safety of the structures and that is already outlined in Section three of our zoning bylaws. So basically uh, inserting that reference, meaning that we are adding this uh, or clarifying it based on that law, not that we are creating new new authority here, I think it would be helpful. Um, so Mr. yes, I do agree it is in that, um, excuse me, chapter 143, section six does include that the local building inspector um, uh has that has that ability um so this this reiterates what is already in in state law but does not contradict what's in state law um yeah so again not to belabor the point um i am not stating that it contradicts state law what i'm saying is it appears to be a duplication here of what's already not only in state law but in our zoning bylaws so if the need here to insert this reference here is to clarify any confusion as to people failing to see that reference in section three of the zoning bylaws, then if so, then let's just insert that reference in full. Right, uh, through through an amendment that you're suggesting, Ms. Mazzino? Correct, basically the, uh, the effort here is to clarify what zoning, what section three of the zoning bylaw is actually saying, which is that under the um, Mass General Laws 146 section six, the building inspector has this authority already. Right, so uh, again, because this is involving issues of, of state law and the subtlety of that, um, uh, I, I'm not gonna allow that uh, amendment at this time. There are other procedural options that you could pursue, but I, I'm not gonna take the time right now to enumerate those um, in front of the meeting. But if, if you have another procedural option that you would uh, care to move, uh, I would cons consider entertaining that. So, so my position, I think I'm, it's not being clear here if it isn't. It's not an argument about the law, whether it applies or not, or if there's any conflict. In and of itself, it's a duplication. It's almost an unnecessary amendment here. But if the effort here is to clarify any ambiguity, then what I am saying is, then if that's the case, then let's refer to the section that we're trying to clarify with this amendment. Otherwise, right. basically, yeah. we're saying the same thing in two, three different places. And I, 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 I'm, I'm weary of that because if you're pointing it out in one section and not the others, then are you carving out an exemption by, by assertion? Right. So we're actually, we're over time. We're over seven minutes at this point. Uh, but and I, I, again, I apologize. I'm not going to accept a, that particular motion uh, to amend uh, at this point. Uh, again, there, there are other procedural options, but I, I can't really take the meeting's time to enumerate all those at this time. Uh, thank you. Um, so let's, let's take uh, Ms. Nathan next. Uh, hello, Mr. Moderator, Michelle Nathan, Precinct 11. I um, was listening carefully to the prayer speaker and I also, I don't completely understand her thinking process, but I think she had a good point about um, you could see exceptions. And so then you can argue the, you know, well, it says this here. <clears throat> so therefore I'm correct. So I can just see it can cause problems in the future. Um, but my question was, 
when a structure is deemed determined to be unsafe, I know that there's a lot of things to inspect and there's one director. So is things inspected before it's um, like a contractor would say it's unsafe? Is it a proactive approach or is it a reactive approach? And then I was curious about, it says occasional, I was curious about what is occasional mean and how often are things caught before um, something is done that's not supposed to be done? Thank you. Let's, see, let's take a, uh, uh, we have Mr. Champa here, I see. Uh, Mr. Champa, can you add? Yes. Director of Inspectional, Inspectional Services. Uh, do you have an answer from Ms. Nathan? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mike Champa, Director of Inspectional Services. Um, generally, <clears throat> when a building is, is um, when it's brought to our attention that a building is unsafe, it's generally during construction and the contractors would, as they're working on the building, find um, evidence that they believe it's unsafe. And then we would do our investigation into it and possibly bring in a structural engineer um and go from there it's it's not a short process or uh um or something that that we that we would miss ms nathan oh thank you very much i think i and i'm just curious again about the occasional is it uh, you know like five cases a year or i don't know what it, the word occasional means how many but Mr. Chapman, do you have a sense of like what what sort of like what would be typical? Uh, I mean, it's it's not something that's very often. It's it's and an unsafe um, doesn't always mean that the building has to come down. There, there's only been um, one or two in the past few years that have been to a degree that they've had to come down. Okay. Ms. Nathan. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a point of order from Mr. Foskett. Let's take that now. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Charles Foskett, Precinct 10. Since there are a number of speakers on the list here, um, I'm wondering if, it, if it's in order for me to make a motion uh, to table this article until after the completion of Article 38. Um, I would entertain that since I, there, there, there is something to uh, to, to it, it, it seems like it would be good to have time to assess that, to assess those op for, so, for folks to assess those options. Uh, so yeah, I, I would entertain a, uh, are, you, are you making that motion, Mr. Foskett? Yes, I am. Okay, so we have a motion to, uh, to lay Article 37 on the table. Do we have a second? I see we already have a second from Mr. Levy. Uh, so uh, we have other, another, we have a point of order now from Mr. Slickman. Let's take that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. Uh, is it legal to make a motion through a point of order? No. I, I, I'm going to say no. Um, oh, 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 because Mr. Foskett just did that, didn't he? Um, hmm. Mr. Moderator? Mr. Foskett? Yes, I, I would argue that uh, I made the motion after you asked me. That is true. Uh, so, so well, we are where we are right now. Um, so, uh, I, I will entertain Mr. Foskett's uh, uh, motion, and we do have a second. Um, and that's something procedural we we, we can talk about offline. Um, um, so, if there are any uh, objections to laying Article Thirty Seven on the table, um, I mean. Frankly, we're going to run out of time tonight anyway. Um, uh, let's see, Mr. Uh, let's see. So we have uh, there are objections to. So the, the raising hand, if you're objecting to laying Article 37 on the table, um, okay, this is a, a lot of hands going up. Um, laying on the table is a two thirds vote. So um, the objections would have to uh, exceed uh, 
one third of the voting members. And so we're getting numbers that are high enough that uh, right now at 44, 45, let's see. Okay, one second. Okay, we're at 52. 52 out of, so it's 214 is the denominator of voters here that I see uh, in, within among the participants. And I'll subtract off the ones uh, who are not time members. Go back. Three, so we're at 210. Um, so by my count, we have. Well, it's inching closer and closer to one third. Like, this is just not a good format for doing this vote since it's actually very close to being one third objections, which would, if it exceeds one third of uh, uh, objections, then we're effectively at less than two thirds, but we're dancing close to that. We haven't quite reached yet. Let's see, have we gotten there? We're at 63 now. 64 right now at 30.5%. Um, be nice if we didn't have to take a few minutes to take like an official vote on this. Um, let's just give folks another 20 seconds to get their, their hands raised that they object to laying 30, Article 38, uh, I'm sorry, Article 37 on the table. Apologize, this is kind of unorthodox. Uh, we are now at 34.7%, uh, 73 out of 210 that I count. It actually, it's way more now, it's now at 84. And so we're well in excess of the one third in objection, which means that we have not reached the two thirds threshold implicitly to lay this on the table. So the motion uh, fails um, to lay this, to lay Article 37 on the table. It is now 11.01 PM. After that very interesting uh, procedural gymnastics we just did, I would entertain a motion to, uh, uh, to adjourn at this point. So moderator Charles Foskett, precinct 10, I move we adjourn. Okay. Second. Um, and we have a motion to adjourn from Mr. Foskett. Uh, before I uh, recognize that second, do we have any notices of reconsideration for tonight? Uh, everyone could lower their hands in Zoom. Looks like they're all lowered now. Um, we have, so raise your hand if you want to give notice of reconsideration on a vote that you voted tonight. Uh, on the prevailing side. Okay, let's take uh, Mr. Jameson. Let's bring him up uh, to give his notice of consideration. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. I disagree completely with the, the procedures that have been done in the last five minutes. Mr. Foskett moved to uh, uh, put something on the table and basically made us um, have to adjourn when we could have taken a vote on this article. I'm very disappointed with the procedure and I would suggest that we continue and not um, adjourn until we've continued to finish this article tonight. We need to get stuff done. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. That's it. So thank you, um, thank you Mr. Jameson. Uh, just give me a second here. Let me just consult something here. Okay, so the, the motion to adjourn to a fixed time is a majority vote. So let's do this properly. Um, and let's, uh, let's open up a vote on uh, adjournment since we're in this kind of weird area where it, in, with this particular article, um, as Mr. Jameson pointed out, and I see we do have other, so we'll bring up a, a majority vote on whether to adjourn. And if this vote fails, we will continue with Article 37, which is still before us because it was not successfully laid upon the table. And so effectively, if you want to continue debating and eventually potentially voting on Article 37, you can vote no on adjournment. And hopefully that remedies this uh, uh, procedural um, anomaly that we've gotten into. And we, we have uh, points of order here from uh, uh, Mr. Can we take up Mr. Warden's uh, point of order, please?
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, John Wood and Precinct, uh, Precinct 8. Uh, I was going to uh, ask you under a point of order whether it would be appropriate for me to move to postpone uh, Article 37 to a time certain, namely after Article 38. That only requires a majority vote. Thank Correct, you, sir. sir. Uh, are, you asking, are, you, are you making I that I guess it's moot now, but. Yeah, yeah, it'll effectively be the same as a journey, effectively, right? It'd be affected like, uh, uh, yeah. Um, so let's see, we have uh, another point of order from Ms. Weber. Let's take that and then we'll go to the, the vote on adjournment. Janice Weber, Precinct 21. I just don't understand the reason for um, postponing this because I don't know what it has to do with Article 38. It doesn't seem to interfere with it. So I would prefer, I don't, I just don't understand why we're having this discussion. I, I agree. I don't understand the connection to Article 38, 38 but I'm, I'm not really using that reference as, uh, um, you know, uh, in my determination of the procedure at this point. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're now voting on whether to adjourn. This is a majority vote. If you wish to adjourn, uh, vote yes. If you wish to continue with Article 37, which is before us, you can vote no, and we'll continue uh, debating and potentially voting on Article 37. We don't normally do this, but the timing tonight was awkward. Um, and admittedly, the, the, the motion to, uh, to table from a point of order was also awkward. Um, but this is this is a, a a much more proper way to do it than um, than the raise hands in Zoom. Okay, so. So please vote on whether to adjourn. A yes vote means that you wish to adjourn. And we will reconvene um, next Wednesday. Uh, vote no if you wish to continue uh, debate on Article uh, 37 tonight. We're now at 177 votes cast. Okay, we're still waiting for several more votes. 180 votes in. Okay, let's give folks now. Let's see. It's possible a number of folks have actually signed off at this point. It's hard to say. Um, okay, so let's give folks just another 30 seconds to get their votes in and whether to adjourn. If you want to adjourn, vote yes. If you want to continue voting or debating Article 37, vote no. 20 seconds until we close voting. Ten seconds. Five seconds until we close voting on whether to adjourn or to continue debate on Article 37. Let's close voting. This is a majority vote. And it passes. Um, 112. In the affirmative, 70 and negative. Um, and so the meeting is adjourned uh, until next Wednesday. Do not sign in on Monday. Uh, that is Memorial Day. Um, and I guess you can stay and, and watch the screens if you like, um, or otherwise we'll see you next week. Thanks everyone.